And he mentions they would sometimes put iron on their bodies and take them out into the sand and leave them there. And every one of them, this is Ibn Mas'ud narrating, every one of them eventually gave up and said what the Quraysh wanted them to say. Of course, this is allowed, nothing wrong with that. So uh, the, ones, the ones that, you know, uh, uh, others that we mentioned, they basically gave up. And they said what they wanted to say, except for Bilal ibn Abi Rabah, Bilal al-Habashi. Except for Bilal. Ibn Mas'ud says, Bilal considered his soul not worth anything in front of Allah. He was willing to give up his soul. He considered his soul insignificant. And he refused to budge one bit. And so they concentrated their efforts on him. And they did to him what they did to nobody else. And Ibn Mas'ud said, I myself saw that Bilal was handed over to the ruffians, the teenagers, the gangs of Mecca. You know, every society has riffraff. Every society has people who just do, you know, I mean, they, they don't have any life of their own. And they're just people who live for the moment, the pleasures. And so Bilal was handed over to this group of ruffians, of gangs. And they would run around with a rope around his neck and drag him through the streets of Medina all the while he was saying Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad This is what Bilal is famous for He is crying Tawheed He is crying the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal And of course the, the, it didn't help that the owner of Bilal the owner of Bilal was one of the uh, worst of the Quraysh and that is Umayyat ibn Khalaf Umayyat ibn Khalaf Umayyat ibn Khalaf uh, personally participated in the torture of Bilal. Now realize it's a delicate line that you're drawing because slaves are very expensive materials and goods, right? Slaves are more expensive than camels. Slaves are more expensive than houses. And therefore, if you want to punish your slave, you are harming your own income. You see the, the conundrum here that slaves are precious property. You know, many people daydream once upon a time there were slaves and whatnot, and we wish we could have them. A'udhu billah. But yeah, the point being, the slaves are much more expensive. You know, you don't think they're like five, ten dollars. They would have been in the equivalent of fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars, right? And so it's a massive amount of money. It's counterintuitive to beat your own slave, because you want him to live a long life, and you want him to serve you. Right? So this shows us the depths of their animosity. It shows us how much hatred they have. They are destroying their most precious property. Because human life is the most precious property that they own. You can buy an animal for much cheaper than you can buy a slave. And for them to be torturing the slaves in this manner really shows uh, the depths of their own uh, profanity, if you like. And so Umayya ibn Khalaf, would, he had a sadistic streak. It's pretty obvious when you read the, the stories. Uh, Umayya ibn Khalaf would personally take Bilal into the desert in the morning and put a large rock. He had other slaves as well. The other slaves would put a rock on his chest and leave him there without food, without water, trapped and pinned under the rock throughout the day when the sun is now at its zenith and its height. And uh, many people narrate to us more than one. Hassan ibn Thabit who is from Medina. He's an Ansari. Of course at the time he's not a Muslim. Hassan ibn Thabit says, I remember doing Hajj in the days of Jahiliyyah. I remember doing Hajj and I saw how severely Bilal was being tortured, and I wondered how he is still alive. This is Hassan ibn Thabit uh, speaking. Amr ibn al-As, uh, also one of the, he's one of the, uh, the leaders of the Quraysh, Amr ibn al-As, he himself narrates that when he was not a Muslim, Amr was not a Muslim, I passed by Bilal when he was being punished upon the rocks of the desert. The rocks were so hot, this is uh, Amr ibn al-As saying that if I were to have put raw meat on them, eventually would have cooked and I could have eaten it. <laughs> the rocks were so hot in this desert sun that it's, you can cook literally on it. And this is literally true. It's not just a, a phrase uh, like that. And Bilal was there for the entire day. And I heard him saying, أَكْفُرُ بِاللَّاتِ وَالْعُزَّةِ وَأُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ I reject Allah and Al-Uzza and I will believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Umayyah continued to try to uh, punish him, uh, but, he con but he refused to budge and he kept on saying, أَحَدٌ أَحَدْ أَحَدٌ أَحَدْ And uh, many years later, Urwat ibn Zubay, the nephew of Aisha, narrated, uh, many years later, Urwat narrated that Bilal was tortured by the people of Mecca and by, and by Umayyah ibn Khalif in particular, but he never even gave them one word to please them. In other words, he didn't budge one word. Most of the others who were tortured, 
they had to collapse and they agreed. And they are completely forgiven. Allah knows we would have given up way before even they had. Uh, but Bilal was one of those few who remained all the way to the end. And look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded him. For we as Muslims firmly believe that there's an expression, uh, memorize this expression, it's a common expression in Arabic, and it goes back to our religion, even though it's not a hadith. A lot of people think it is a hadith. Al-jaza'u min jins al-amal. The reward or the punishment will be the exact same as what you were doing to get that reward or that punishment. هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ If you do ihsan, Allah will give you ihsan. And if you do evil, Allah will give you evil. So your reward will be based upon, will be the same type as what you did. And so will your punishment be. al jazau min jinsil amal. And this is a maxim, this is a rule that we apply in our religion, that Allah Azza wa will either punish or reward based upon and then the same type of what you did. So, look here, this is Bilal. He is yelling at the top of his lungs. He's screaming, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad. Hassan ibn Thabit can hear his torture. He cannot hear what Umayyah is saying. All he can hear is Bilal screaming out, I reject Allah Tan al uzza and I believe in Allah. And so he hears the torture. Wherever he is in Mecca, he can hear it. Eventually, what is Bilal rewarded with? We all know Bilal is rewarded by becoming the first and the most important and the only official mu'adhin of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As he was calling out the unity of Allah in Mecca, persecuted and alone, eventually when Islam reached its pinnacle and it became powerful, he would announce the unity of Allah instead of in humiliation at the pinnacle of Izzah. And he would announce the best and the most perfect adhan. Because when the dream of the adhan was told to the Prophet ﷺ, one of the Sahaba said, I saw a dream about the adhan. The Prophet ﷺ himself chose Bilal and he said, go teach Bilal this because he has the best voice amongst you. He has the best voice amongst you. So the Prophet ﷺ chose Bilal to be the uh, muaddin, And therefore, the voice that was persecuted for the sake of Allah, the voice that was calling out one, 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 was the voice that is calling out Allahu Akbar, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammadu Rasulullah. And when the Prophet ﷺ reconquered Mecca in the eighth year of the Hijrah and he cleansed it of all of the idols, the first thing that he did, he commanded Bilal to climb on top of the Kaaba. And that very Bilal, whose voice of Ahadun Ahad could be heard in the valleys of Mecca, being persecuted. Right? That same voice was then hoisted on top of the Kaaba at the pinnacle of honor, at the height of dignity. And he was told to give the first adhan ever in the sacred precincts of the Haram. And so the first voice to ever call out to Eid in Mecca, all the valleys of Mecca, out loud was the voice of Bilal ibn Abi Rabah. And look at how Allah rewarded Bilal as he was being as he was being persecuted by the Quraysh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded him. And look at the blessings of the Mu'addin, subhanAllah, so many blessings of the Mu'addin that our Prophet ﷺ said, our Prophet ﷺ said that if people knew how much reward would be in the giving the adhan and in standing in the first row, and they had no other way out other than by drawing lots, they would have drawn lots in order to give adhan or to stand in the first row. What this means is that uh, the fact of the matter is that people don't know how important it is, and so, you know, whoever first come, first serve, and you know, whatever, it's no big deal. But if they really understood how much blessing was there, then they would not just give it up, and they would demand, let's be fair here, we'll just have anonymous lots, it's going to pull, who gets to have the first row, who gets to have the adhan? If they knew how blessed it was. And the Prophet ﷺ said, hadith is in Ibn Majah, that any mu'addin who gives adhan, Whatever hears his adhan from animate or inanimate object, min rutbin walayabis, it literally means wet or dry, but the meaning of wet in Arabic here is it's moist, meaning it's a living entity. Yabis, it means rock and stone and trees, right? So no entity, living or, or dead, animate or inanimate, will hear the adhan except that it will testify for him. And in the hadith in Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ said to a shepherd uh, uh, that. Uh, I have been told you are a shepherd, whenever you are in your lands, give the adhan, even if you are alone, it's sunnah to give the adhan, because no jinn or ints will hear your voice, except that on the day of judgment, they will testify to what you have said. So they will testify to your iman. Now, subhanAllah, can anybody click one plus one together here? 
the one person who's giving adhan in front of the Prophet ﷺ, right? What did the Prophet ﷺ say? Whoever hears the adhan, what will he do? Testify on behalf of the mu'adhin, right? And who was the mu'adhin of the Prophet ﷺ by designation and appointment? Bilal. And whose adhan did the Prophet ﷺ hear? Five times a day in Medina. Back and forth, morning and evening. For 13, for more than, well, uh, 10 years here and then uh, in Mecca as well, whenever they gave the Adhan al Alqam, as we're going to talk about, at least 11, 12 years, right? He is hearing non-stop, every single time, the voice of Bilal. And he is the one saying that the Mu'adhin, whoever hears his voice, will testify on behalf of the Mu'adhin on the Day of Judgment. So subhanAllah, look at how the, the Daraja, the Maqam of Bilal ibn Abi Rabah, and of course our Prophet has many more a hadith about the blessings of the Adhan. Uh, of course, of them is the fam famous hadith in Bukhari, that the Mu'adhins will have the longest necks on the Day of Judgment. What does it mean they're going to have the longest necks? It doesn't mean they're going to be like giraffes. Atwaru uh, a'naqan, it's an expression in Arabic, it could mean they will have the greatest honor. Because, uh, again, Arabs love, uh, the classical Arabic loves uh, symbolism, right? And so, when you look up to somebody, this means he is worthy of honor, right? And therefore, if he has a long neck, this means, even in English we say, I'm looking up to you. Even in English, you know, even though he might be shorter than you, looking down at him, right? But I'm looking up to you, meaning you respect him. Okay, and so the meaning of the Mu'adhin will have the longest neck, uh, it primarily means they will be the most respected on the Day of Judgment. Right? All of these are hadith about the blessings of the Mu'adhin and the official Mu'adhin of the Prophet is Bilal. Another early name that we just mentioned is Khabbab. Khabbab ibn al-Arat. And Khabbab ibn al-Arat was one of the first ten converts of Islam as well. And he was a slave an Arab slave, and generally they treated Arab slaves better than non-Arabs, you know, as you know it was a racist society, so Arab slaves had it a little bit better. And so Bilal really was the most tortured because he was not even an Arab, he was an Abyssinian. And by the way, I have to point out here as well, subhanAllah, look at the psychology of that society, that uh, the riffraff, the ruffians, the youth, can torture this slave and drag him through the streets with a, with a rope around his neck. I mean, this is the height of... of Barbarity, right? And he, even if these, these teenagers that they're giving Bilal over to, these ruffians, they have no, nothing at stake other than sadistic pleasure, basically, right? And the only way that you can get away with this as a society is to dehumanize a group of people. Consider them to be just not even human. And we've seen in history what the Nazis did to the Jews, right? That you have no sympathy, no mercy, mother, woman, child, doesn't matter. Elderly, it's just this sense, or not just to the Jews, to the gypsies, to the Romanians, to anybody they didn't like. The Nazis had this, we are superior. And therefore anybody who's not of their race becomes D, he's not even human. And therefore whatever happens, society doesn't pay attention. You see all of society sees this torture happening to Bilal. They don't blink an eyelid. Because for them, Bilal is not human. Because, or you, know, you see what I'm saying, it's just, they're not, they're not considering any respect given because he's not an Arab or he's not a Qurashi, especially Qurashi. And of course they have, and that's why Islam came and demolished this whole jahiliyyah of having caste systems based upon one's lineage and based upon one's skin.